Ona Judge, a former slave, was on the run. The nephew of her owner had found her hiding place in New Hampshire. If he found her and returned her to their plantation in Virginia, she would have to resume her life as a slave. Not only that, but they would claim her infant daughter as their property as well. Ona Judge, like many fugitive slaves in the latter part of the 18th century in the United States, had defied her owner and run away seeking freedom. But Ona Judge's situation was somewhat unique in that the owner that she was fleeing was George Washington, president of the newly minted United States of America. And her story is a story that deserves to be remembered. Ona was born around 1773 to Betty Davis, a slave who had belonged to Daniel Park Custis, Martha Washington's first husband. Betty was, by all accounts, a talented seamstress. Ona's father, Andrew Judge, was a white indentured servant who also made clothing. According to manager's records from Mount Vernon, Judge created the now iconic blue uniform that George Washington wore when he was appointed commander-in-chief of the Continental Army in 1774 during the Revolutionary War. As an indentured white servant, Judge was able to work off his contract and establish a life for himself elsewhere in America. Betty and her daughter Ona did not have that option as they were slaves belonging to the Custis estate. When Daniel Custis died in July 1757 at the age of 45, his estate did not have a will. As a result, one third of the property belonging to Custis went to Martha, which included a number of slaves. This property was called the Dower Share, and the rest of the property was held in trust for any of Custis's surviving children. Upon Martha's death, any of her property, including the slaves, would revert to the Custis estate. When Martha married George Washington, two years after her first husband's death, her portion of her Custis property had made her one of the most wealthy widows in Virginia. According to the law at the time, the child of a slave belonged to whoever owned the mother at the time that the child was born, even if her father happened to be an indentured servant, as it was with Ona Judge. His legacy to her was light skin, freckles, and her name, Ona Maria Judge. Eric Dunbar, author of the book Never Caught, The Washington's Relentless Pursuit of Their Runaway Slave, Ona Judge, noted that it was rare for a slave even to have a middle name, and that her name had a Gaelic origin. According to records, she was the only slave in all of Virginia named Ona at the time. Ona began her service as a personal attendant to Martha Washington when she was just 10 years old. She, like her mother before her, served in the master's quarters at Mount Vernon. Her duties may have included anything from sewing to cooking and light cleaning. Ona was one of a handful of slaves chosen by the Washingtons to accompany them to New York during George Washington's first presidential term. He was notified of his election by electoral vote to the highest position in government by a letter from the Senate's President Pro Tem, John Langdon of New Hampshire. It read, Sir, I have the honor to transmit to Your Excellency the information of your unanimous election to the office of the President of the United States of America. Washington wasn't excited about his election. He was tired from his service in the war and his plantation wasn't making the money it needed to stay afloat. In his diary, before leaving for New York, where the U.S. had its capital at the time, he wrote, About ten o'clock I bade adieu to Mount Vernon, to private life, and to domestic felicity, and with a mind oppressed with more anxious and painful sensations than I have words to express. Ona was 16 years old when she traveled with the Washingtons. This is probably the first time she met or even saw free black persons living and working in New York City. First at the presidential mansion on Cherry Street, which was also called the Samuel Osgood House, and then at the Alexander McComb House, Ona worked alongside slaves for Mount Vernon, as well as indentured white servants, to keep the Washingtons in style. As the new leader of the nation and setting presidents for the office, George Washington expected his household staff to look the part. He dressed his slaves and indentured servants in expensive clothing, and Ona, though she wasn't able to take a part of the glittering society in whose circles Martha Washington moved, was a recognizable member of the Washington household. As Martha's personal servant, she went everywhere Martha traveled, ensuring her comfort throughout the day. The living quarters in New York City were more cramped than Ona was accustomed to. In Mount Vernon, the slaves had their own quarters and homes, separate from the Washingtons. There was no such privacy in New York, which also meant that she spent more time working and less time on her own. In 1790, the capital of the United States moved from New York City to Philadelphia because of a political compromise which led to the construction of Washington, D.C. There was disagreement among the states in the Union about where the new capital should be. The northern government officials wanted the capital to be up north, while most of the southern representatives, George Washington included, wanted the capital to be in Virginia. 
Meanwhile, Alexander Hamilton was trying to drum up support to pass a bill in which the federal government assumed some of the state's debts that had been incurred during the Revolutionary War. With the help of James Madison and Thomas Jefferson, Hamilton secured enough support from Southern representatives to push through his debt program called the Assumption Bill, and he helped pass the Residence Bill. The Residence Bill to create a temporary federal capital would be set up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania for 10 years while a permanent capital was being constructed at the site of what would later be named Washington, the District of Columbia. It was while Washington was in residence in Philadelphia with his family and hand-picked slaves that he discovered that he could lose his human property. Pennsylvania was founded in 1681 by William Penn, a Quaker who received a royal land grant from the British King Charles II. The state had been seeking ways to abolish slavery for years, though some Quakers owned slaves. In the late 1700s, a rural movement began to encourage anyone who was a Quaker, called a friend, to stop purchasing slaves. The movement gained momentum when in March 1780, Pennsylvania passed the first gradual emancipation laws in the United States that said that slaves would become free persons upon reaching the age of 28. It forbid the importation of new slaves and also said that any children born in Pennsylvania were free, despite whatever status may have been held by their parents. It required all slaves in Pennsylvania to be registered by their owners to prevent new slaves from being imported. Then, in 1788, the law was amended to forbid slave owners from moving pregnant slaves to other states so that their child would be born into slavery outside of state lines. It also prohibited another loophole that had been used by slaveholders visiting Pennsylvania. After six months of residency in the state, Pennsylvania said the slaves were gradually emancipated under state law. However, if the slaveholder moved them outside of Pennsylvania and then back in again, it reset the clock, so to speak, and began the residency timer again. The 1788 law forbid this ro rotation. However, both laws exempted members of Congress from the emancipation process. There was a question if George Washington was covered under this exemption because he was a part of the newly created executive branch, which is separate from the legislative branch of the United States government. The slaves residing in Pennsylvania with him could have been subjected to Pennsylvania state law. The issue became more of a concern to Washington after a visit with Attorney General Edmund Randolph. Randolph, a former Virginia governor, had lost a handful of slaves after they had learned of Pennsylvania's law and taking advantage of it to claim their freedom. He told the president that the same could happen to him. Washington's plantation was still struggling and the loss of slaves was incredibly expensive. He made the decision to begin rotating Ona and the others in his household in and out of the state in an effort to circumvent the laws and keep their status as property. He did so quietly first to not incite disagreement among government representatives about the slavery issue, but also so that the slaves over age 28 wouldn't know their chance at freedom was being taken away every six months. At only age 20, Ona wasn't yet eligible for emancipation under Pennsylvania law, but someday she would be. Tobias Lear, Washington's personal secretary, helped the president move his family to and from the state from 1791 to 1796. He showed the thoughts about human bondage to that era in a note to the president that read, You will permit me now, sir, to declare that no consideration should induce me to take these steps to prolong the slavery of a human being had I not the fullest confidence that they will at some future period be liberated, and the strongest conviction that their situation with you is far preferable to what they would probably obtain in a state of freedom. Ona disagreed with the sentiment. She was further determined to flee after Martha's granddaughter, Elizabeth Park Custis, married Thomas Law, and as a wedding present, Martha decided to give Ona to Elizabeth. Elizabeth Park Custis was known for being difficult without respect for society's laws governing women and the proper role within them. That mercurial temper did not bode well for Elizabeth's future slave. On May 21st, 1796, Ona ran away while the Washingtons were eating their evening meal. She disappeared into Philadelphia with the help of abolitionists and the free black population. The Washingtons ran an ad in the paper offering a reward for her return. The ad read, Absconded from the household of the President of the United States on Saturday afternoon. Ona Judge, a light mulatto girl, much freckled with very black eyes and bushy black hair. She is of middle stature, but slender, and delicately made, about 20 years of age. Despite these efforts to recapture her, Ona had disappeared. Later in her life, Ona revealed to journalists that she made her way to the coast after she fled and boarded a ship called Nancy, captained by John Bowles. The ship bore her to New Hampshire, where she set up life as a free black woman in the port town of Portsmouth.
In an unfortunate coincidence, Ona was recognized on the streets of Portsmouth by Elizabeth Langdon, the daughter of Senator John Langdon, the man who had written Washington to inform him of his selection as the first president. The Langdons informed Washington that his slave was residing in Portsmouth. The Washingtons worked with Secretary of State Oliver Walcott Jr. and a Portsmouth customs officer named Joseph Whipple to ask Ona to return to Virginia and slavery. George Washington wrote, The ingratitude of the girl, who was brought up and treated more like a child than a servant, ought not to escape with impunity if it can be avoided. He also mentioned Martha's desire to have her personal assistant back. Whipple spread false information around Portsmouth's free black population that he was looking for a domestic servant. Ona answered his request and, while at a meeting, Whipple asked her if she would be willing to return to Virginia and slavery. She refused and left. Whipple, unwilling to resort to force, wrote to Washington and Wolcott that she wouldn't return. He also answered Washington's questions about why she left. A thirst for complete freedom had been her only motive for absconding. Ona married a free black man named Jack Staines, and their wedding announcement was published in the New Hampshire Gazette on January 14, 1797. They had a daughter named Eliza in 1798, when Washington's nephew, Burwell Bassett Jr., showed up at their doorstep, again ask, asking Ona to return to Virginia. With her husband Jack, who was a sailor away on a voyage, Ona refused Bassett's request, just as she rejected Whipple's. But Bassett wasn't going to take no for an answer. He returned to John Langdon's house, saying he was going to take Ona back by force to Virginia. Either Langdon or someone from his household sent a warning to Ona, and she fled with her infant to the next county before Bassett returned. Washington's will stipulated that all of his slaves should be freed upon the death of his wife Martha. Martha, concerned that this gave the slaves a motive to kill her, actually freed the slaves before she died in 1801. But she did not free her dower slaves, including Ona Judge, because she didn't have the right to do so. Upon her death, they became the property of the Custis estate. Ona Judge and her children were still by law slaves, and the 1793 Fugitive Slave Act, which was signed by George Washington, gave a method by which the Custises could have captured her and taken her back into slavery, although there's no evidence that the Custises ever tried. Jack Staines died in 1803 and left Ona a widow with three children, two daughters and a son. She lived the rest of her life in poverty and eventually had to indenture her two daughters in order to keep them fed. All of her children died before her, leaving her alone by the time in 1848 that she passed away at the age of 75. But before she died, she told her story to two different newspapers, providing one of the very few first-hand accounts from a female fugitive slave from Virginia in the 18th century, and very few accounts from a slave personally owned by George Washington. She was adamant that her life, although rough, but of her choosing, was superior to life as a slave. She had chosen to worship God and marry as she saw fit. She said, I am free and I trust have been made a child of God by the means. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow the History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.